I'm Dr. Pete Economo, the East Coast psychologist. And I'm Dr. Nikki Rubin, the West Coast psychologist. And this is When East Meets West. Pete, I'm really excited about this episode because I talk about this all the time with people. I've already, you know, said this many times in this podcast. Uh, So today we are going to talk about the difference between the brain and the mind. Insert like sound of the mind being blown. (laughs) Um, So, yeah. So I think this is really interesting because I would say in my experience <laughs> as a human being, You're human. One, <laughs> yeah, I'm a human and uh, as a psychologist uh, clinically, this, this is very confusing for folks. People yeah. do not see them as separate things. Is that, is that your experience as totally. well? Right? well? It's so abstract. Yeah. It's, it, it's not, this is such a higher level. It's philosophical. Well, the mind is. That's right. But the brain isn't. <laughs> well, but the, but the no, correct. But the right? idea of even trying to segregate the two, mm-hmm. you know, because because where's the mind housed? Right. Well, it's like where's the soul housed? That's right. Right. Where's I mean, yeah, totally. And well, that's why I say saying philosophical. Well, sure, sure. Well, so okay, so maybe I can just like start by throwing out some things I've, I've reiterated in other episodes, or re- I'm reiterating now. I've said in other episodes, which is to that point. It, ask anybody, we experience our minds in our skulls. Like nobody experiences thinking like in their tush. <laughs> I don't know. No, I'm no, I am uh, not. You don't disagree? I am not accepting. Okay. That. Let me, uh, let me rephrase. I've never, I've never met anybody that said that. I've never read yes, anything. You have. Or some, what? I've never You're talking to him right now. You experience your mind in your, in your. I don't know where the mind is. T- well, but when you're, I'm going to push you on that a little bit. When <laughs> you're, <laughs> when, when you're thinking. Uh-huh. And that's a behavior, right? When you're thinking a covert behavior. Where do you feel it? In your shoulder? In your earlobe? Depends. Did I swim that morning or not? I don't, when you're swimming, it doesn't matter. Where do you, where is the thinking happening? I, yes. So because the brain is neurologically processing thoughts, I think that's why we're getting at the fact that it's happening in the brain. Right. Well, well, this is where I'm saying it's happening in the skull. Okay. Right. It's happening. That's what I, I no, don't I, I think we should say the brain, the organ there. Well, I think that's where, so that's, I think what you're starting to cross into. It's like, where is the mind in the brain? We don't, we don't know. It's like, so. But we know that I, the brain processes thoughts. So I sure, think when you say the behavior sure. of thinking that I'm going to, I'll be with you on. Sure. Sure. But if we say in the skull, like, hold on, let's think about mm-hmm, this. Mm-hmm, Cause then this, mm-hmm. is it also in the fluid, like in the spinal fluid? That's the part where I go like, I don't know. I'm just, I'm just <laughs> saying, with, I'm, I'm just saying like within when I'm thinking, I know I experience my mind in in the general head region. I don't How cool think would it be if it could be in your tush? And how cool is it that you use the word tush? <laughs> I knew I was like, <laughs> I almost great. said butt. I almost said butt. And then I thought, eh, no, I just tush feels right. Tush, here. <laughs> I, and, I, and, and that just, it's made my day. So thank you for that. <laughs> you're, you're, you're welcome. That's, <laughs> tush. Got, got, to, got to bring a little Yiddish into, into this podcast. <laughs> is that Yiddish? Now, but, like, like, I think so. Like tushy. <laughs> Sorry, guys. We, we didn't know we were, I didn't know we were going there. All right, we, sorry. Like, we digress. Yeah, yeah. Go. We digress. So, okay. So. Skull. Thinking. Skull, gotcha. Right. Right. But mm-hmm. the brain, the brain is a freaking organ. The brain is an organ, right? It is mm-hmm. a, made of tissue. You know, there are neurons, like neuron cells in there. We, there's like electrical firings, mm-hmm. right? Mm-hmm. And the brain functions and malfunctions like at the same rates as every other part of the body. Mm-hmm. Right. Sometimes it needs medicine. Right. Like we can't like just like we can't like think our way into making our, um, you know, our hearts slow down. Like we could like do certain breathing exercise that might slow down the heart rate. But we can't say stop beating heart like that doesn't work. But people talk to their brains that would be right? scary if that happened. Anyway. Oh, my gosh. That would be horrifying. <laughs> right. That's that's such a well, yeah. But Stomach. People, stop growling. I mean, we might growling. we might want that to happen. Yeah. Right. Stop. Why are women so embarrassed by that? By, by, I don't, I don't know. I'm not embarrassed by my stomach growling, but you're maybe, not? nah. But maybe I just made a big gender I, stereotype. Maybe that is, but well, no, I think people, whatever. I, I don't, I don't embarrass that easily. Maybe that's that's part of what. Yeah, I'm yeah. Um. So yeah, but like, but my, but clinically, I always experience people are always telling me, especially when I'm like sending them for like a like a med consult, right? Yeah. Like if I think their brains need medication support, yeah. It's like no, I can do this on my own. I'm like okay. Your mind is not your brain. Right. You know? Yeah. So, so I don't your know. Mind. Okay. So, 
your yeah. mind is not your brain. And in Eastern tradition, I mean, I think that yeah. there's a lot on this where, yeah. and, and, I, and I, I feel like I'm reflecting a lot on like some like high school classes hmm. where I don't know that my brain was ready to understand this. Like you learn this, that the mind is formless, yeah. that the mind is like fluid and, uh-huh. and is not really a construct. Uh-huh. And I think that that just is so hard to understand and to comprehend. I love that you just brought that up because that's actually such an, like a beautiful example of, again, how the brain, the brain is not the mind. Cause when you're in high school, yeah. your brain is very underdeveloped. Like our brains grow and not a lot of people are aware of this. Like they, the research shows like men's brains grow till they're about 28 women's brains till about 26. Cause we're smarter. Yay yeah. guys. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, didn't do, I didn't do the research. I'm just reporting it. Um, well, no, so, that's also because women brains, you have more words earlier. So oh, women's brains yes. develop faster and yes, quicker because yeah. they're smarter from the get-go. <laughs> well, not so true, I, got, but, I got you. Yeah. But so, so when you're a teenager, your brain, the organ of the brain, just like the rest of your body is not fully developed yet as an adult. And so it can't process this concept of the mind like I have such a memory like being like I think I was 14 and I was trying to read catch 22 and I have such have such a memory of like not getting it like Mm -hmm. I don't like I could read it but it was like for some reason the concept wasn't landing with me and then I remember being like 25 or something and rereading it and going like oh yeah like now my brain has the capacity to process but to your point it's like yeah the mind is this it's this formless abstract thing and like you're the organ of your brain doesn't have the computing power at 15 or whatever to understand not what a, that means. Not at all. And frankly, even at my age, which <laughs> today I'm not sure <laughs> that I have it, especially depends on the day of the week or the time of the day. Right, right, right. Totally. You know, how rested is my brain to really conceptualize this stuff? Because it, it, it's it's very, it's intellectual. It is. You know, it so is. we're also calling it philosophical, but it's intellectual. The Buddhists would really say, and Thit Nhat Hanh has written a lot about this because the mind is typically somewhat synonymous with consciousness and i, I know mm-hmm. we've been saying that forever we need to do an episode on that too. Yeah, yeah, yeah yeah but like it's a it's the map within the understanding of the mind is really related directly to consciousness so i i do think it's worth just like dipping our toes in a little bit there because i i think again like these are kind of inner interwoven but say say a little bit more about why um why he says that well, I'm, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not sure. Like, You're like, I'm not I don't sure. know. I don't know. I mean, I, I get, I intellectually, it's about this idea that because it is, uh, it's, it's intangible. Mm-hmm. It is, you know, it's somehow connected with neurology or neuroscience. Mm-hmm. You know, mm-hmm. I think a lot of the stuff I read in like neuroscience or like some of these more like Buddhist writers will say like neuroscience has so much to learn from Buddhism. Oh, yeah. Rather than Buddhism learning from neuroscience, because I think, you know, but also like I think we're trying to apply the the scientific method to something that might not be researchable. Yeah. Yeah. What do you you think about that? (laughs) So I think that's so important because this this then gets into. I can't, I know I bring this up a lot, but it's like there's like a spirituality component. It's just like this. They're like intangible things that we also know when we're connected to them. So I think that's, I think that's right though. You know, I, I do want to make tush. sure. <laughs> it's not, it's not in the tush. <laughs> I'm like, am I going to regret saying that? Maybe. Uh, I wish it was in the tush. Um, you know, but it's funny because, but the mind is something that we work with a lot, like yeah. both, you know, as in cognitive behavioral therapies and also uh, in mindfulness, right. You know, that, I actually, and this is going to, of course, also fold a little bit maybe into like the consciousness stuff. I like to help people distinguish between, and get ready for this, who they are mm. and what their mind is. And so I'll say like, your mind is always chattering at you, right? Yes. Like there's a um, very famous um, mindfulness teacher, psychologist, Jack Cornfield, mm-hmm. who says, the mind secretes thoughts the way the salivary glands secrete saliva, right? Yeah. It's like, that's what it does. It just like turns out thinking. And so I'll tell people like, your mind is always chattering at you. And in fact, in acceptance and commitment therapy and act, there's like, you know, sort of like a, you know, a, a technique that we'll often say to people like, thank your mind, like, thank your mind for saying that, or that's your mind mm-hmm. saying that. And I'll say, so your mind's always chattering at you. And then I invite people to connect with, again, values and intuition and their gut. And I'll say, that's your authentic you. That's not your mind. Mm -hmm. Right. And 
you know, whether we interact with our minds, like that's our power to determine, like, do we listen to it? Do we not listen to it? But like, whatever your mind's saying to you, that's not the same thing as like your authentic self. I mean, yeah. and again, I know we're getting now we're getting out there a little bit, but does that? But this is out there because it's it, it's philosophical. Like it is in Buddhism, we also say there is no self. Mm-hmm. You know, so it's really about just diffusing from all of it. And and um, my teacher, and I think it was maybe last week or the week before, you know, we're doing some virtual lessons, and he was like, you know, nothing um, nothing exists outside the mind. Mm-hmm. You know, and so like that's the other uh, teaching within 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 Zen is that everything is about how we perceive it and our mind is that construct that doesn't actually have a construct right. that processes or i, I like that secretes the secretes i like that yeah it secretes the mind secretes thoughts with the sound yeah, the glands, secre- secretes, secretes, yeah. secretes saliva yeah yeah, yeah secretes just, saliva that's like a tongue twister it is it is secretes saliva. well because it's just when i also what i like about that one is it speaks to um if, if there could be a trigger that shows up that it increases the production of saliva or thoughts, right? Like right now, you, everyone has saliva, their salivary glands are screening saliva, whether you're eating food or not. However, if you, if a Domino's pizza came in here right now, you know, or if we say the word thought, lemon, yes, or think right. of eating a lemon right now. I'd rather think about eating a Domino's pizza, but go I ahead. Know. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> but that sourness is going to create yes. more saliva than Domino's. I would like to. Yeah. Dom- right. Sounds it. good. Yes. Dominos, are you going to sponsor us? Yeah. yeah. So please. So, but yeah, so that is going to increase yeah. saliva production. So it's like the mind is going to secrete thoughts, even if you're like super chilled out and relaxed on a beach somewhere, but then let's say, you know, somebody says something hurtful to you or, you know, you, it's really hot outside or you see somebody attractive, the mind is going to start to produce more thoughts. Right. Mm-hmm. Um, That's right. So, but, okay. So let's come back to this concept of like distinguishing this from the brain, because mm-hmm. again, like I would say, most people think that their brains are their minds, which leads to this um, really inaccurate belief that we have like a hundred percent agency over over what our brains do. And it's really problematic because it's not like I would say, like we gotta bow down to the power of this as as a as a human body part, right? I mean, That's do you right. find that that people like have that um have that assumption like do you see that a lot clinically as well where it's like you know i don't know they're just like i can think my way out of it or you know or like i want to cut my brain out or Mm -hmm. i mean there's a good there's a book i've used with clients brain on fire have you ever used that or read that i've heard of it actually but i haven't read it i think it's Susanna callahan um but it was it's it's about just this idea of like the mental health journey and how you just feel like your brain's on fire so i like that because then that's people wanted to pull it out but really it's not your brain i mean again like if we can really conceptualize it as an organ and think about what it's doing i mean it's 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 having a sleep it's regulating our homeostatic state it's i mean there's nothing i mean it's it's beating our heart right It's, it's it's having us talk right now it's having me lose some words when I'm trying to lose words, <laughs> like word finding. Right. It's doing all this beautiful stuff. Well, and it's doing not beautiful stuff. And That's everybody's, right. and I like to say to people, everyone's brain's wired a little bit some way. And I'll, you know, obviously often I'm talking about emotion where I'll say like, some people are wired a little bit more towards anxiety. Some people a little bit more towards irritability. Some people towards uh, actually like being disconnected from emotion, yeah. you know, but it's like, if we don't, except that that's just how your particular body works. Then there's this illusion that's created, like, you know, that being mentally healthy means like not struggling. And I'll say like, that'd be like saying, I don't know, like there's some people like their stomachs like are sensitive to spicy food. It's like, okay, like, what's wrong with them? Right. (laughs) Well, and it's like, okay, that's just how your body is designed. Like you didn't choose that. You can decide maybe you're going to eat spicy food. And then, you know, like you're going to have a stomach ache afterwards, or you might choose to not eat spicy food, but that's just the way you're, you didn't choose that. That's just like your body part, right? Yeah, or like lactose, you know, you'll, you'll mm-hmm. eat ice cream because you enjoy it, even though you know that you'll have a terrible stomach ache after. Right. I, I wanted to, I think, uh, if I may, the nature yes, of the mind please. just within, yeah. there's like the two main points that we think about. The main is that there's the, the, there, which we haven't talked about at all, is the idea of connecting the mind with karma. And so for listeners, mm-hmm. karma is the energy in which you live in this life that then it comes back in your next life mm-hmm. essentially so mm-hmm. what am i am i doing the eightfold path these like right 
action, right mm-hmm. mindfulness, right thought, right speech in an attempt to have a better life in my, when, I'm, when I'm reborn, reincarnated. The mind is directly connected to that because that's part of how we could send good energy or send an intention you know, mm. for other folks. And we do that through our mind, you know, not our brain. Right. Our brains, like you said, like, I, I love that you brought in the part, like, yeah, our brains like regulating our heartbeat and, yeah. <laughs> and doing all these other things and, um, and maybe like causing a little too much anxiety or whatever. Right. Yeah. The, the mind is what we can learn to, um, we can learn to, to shape how we interact with it. Maybe is the best way to say it. Right. Well, it's a beautiful way. Uh, and then the other piece of it is that the state of the mind actually plays a crucial role, both in our happiness and in our suffering. Because if you think about mm-hmm. it, that's how we interpret happiness and it's how we interpret suffering. And that's all a part of the experience. So in the Buddhist teachings, you're going to learn how your mind is directly connected to overall happiness and suffering. Yeah. Because, you know, if I can take it a step further here, it would be that we can, we can learn to help our minds see the world more accurately. Right. Mm -hmm. You know, and so that's going to help us reduce suffering because, if we can accept and experience pain, right? That's how we reduce suffering. And it also helps us connect with, with joyful experiences. Exactly. So it's, it's not going to change the brains that we were given, right? No. It influences them, right? Like if your mind is like judging your anxiety all the time, it's going to yeah. make your anxiety more intense, That's right. right? If your mind is like, okay, I have anxiety. That's, that's uncomfortable. I'm mindfully experiencing it. It's not going to get you a new brain without anxiety, but it is going to, keep the anxiety where it is at baseline, right? It- yeah, because many people that we work with would want new brains, but I don't know that the new brain would fix what their experience is. And that's the ultimate teaching. Yeah, because there's, no, it goes back to this thing we always talk about, because there's there's no perfect life. There's no, no perfect body. There's no perfect brain. There's no perfect experience. You know, and I often say to people when we're talking about accepting the parts of their brain that they don't like, I'll say mm-hmm. like, we're not getting you a new brain and we don't want to get you a new brain. I'm like, your brain's great in lots of ways. There's also things you don't like about it. Right. right? And we're going to learn to interact with that in a more effective way using the mind, (laughs) using the mind. Right. Yeah. 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 Beautiful distinction between the two and, and really challenging listeners to think about ways that they do that. Another way of accessing the mind is also through yoga practice, Mm -hmm. which again, you don't think about it, but for our listeners, I mean, yoga was developed, for a, a warm up to meditate. Yep. You know, and so and, and meditation is likely involving all of the mind. Right. And yeah, very- well, we're we're connected. We're learning to interact with it in a different way, you know? Yeah. Um absolutely. Yeah. I, I don't I, I by the way, it's like I, I don't think a lot of people are familiar with that that yoga you know, yoga is a, we got to do an episode on yoga too, of course, um, a whole system. Well, because I'm, I'm going to make a judgment of like all y- your folks there on the West coast, uh, you know, definitely have, uh, Hollywoodized it and made it the exercise yeah. and the glamorous exercise. Yes. Uh, but really traditionally speaking, it was a way to warm up your mind. So, so traditionally speaking, people would do an hour long, hour and a half long of, of yoga just to then go to sit meditate. for two or three hours, Totally. you know, yeah. because it, it's a really critical balance between the two. Uh, and that's what I say, like most other exercises, like being a hamster on a wheel, you know, you don't have to think you can just kind of go through the motions. Whereas yoga requires mind and body and it's just you on the mat and it, and it you know it, it encourages you not to judge yourself not to judge your performance mm-hmm. on the person next to you to set an intention for someone that might be suffering at the beginning at the end of your practice to acknowledge and honor that all beings suffer well yeah while while using um using the physical body to do that and that you know ties in very nicely where the brain is part of the physical body right so i'll end by saying you know Brains are organs, you guys. <laughs> Brains are organs. We've got to take them off the pedestal. They're cool. They're not that cool, right? They're just as cool as, as other parts of the body. Um, and the more we can understand and accept our brains, parts we like and parts we don't like as they are, we can then also shift our attention to learning to interact with the mind in a more effective way. This has been When East Meets West. I'm Dr. Nikki Rubin. And I'm Dr. Pete Economo. Be present, be brave. This has been When East Meets West. All material is based on opinion and educational training of Drs. Pete Economo and Nikki Rubin. Content is for informational and educational purposes only.